Here we go. Hey, Marisa, why are you getting so bundled up? It's pretty warm out here in Santa Cruz, no? Well, I heard we were going to Antarctica today. It's probably pretty cold there. Do you guys know how cold it is in Antarctica today? I think it's about minus 17. It's definitely brisk down there. Yeah, seriously, I think it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere, so I want to be prepared. This might not be enough. Yeah, maybe we could maybe save you a trip and just stay here and talk about Antarctica a little bit? Sh yeah, sure. Do you guys have some information to share about Antarctica today? We do, in fact. Um, and we and we were just, you know, we can't wait to share uh, some of the stuff that Gavin and I have been learning about an Antarctica with with you and, and all our viewers out here. Wonderful, yeah, I heard that you guys have been making waves out in the science news. Um, so I can't wait to hear uh, what you guys have been up to. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, well, here we go. Um, yeah, so today, uh, even though we're, we're going to the very, very cold um, East Antarctica, it, we're actually gonna be talking about some of the melting of East Antarctica that happened in the past and um, you know some of the uh, important important implications that has for for our future isn't that right Gav? Yeah I think that this is going to be a good one today we'll talk about some of the work that we've been doing up with our advisor at UCSC and a, particularly a paper that that just came out some hot off the press science news. Yeah and so we've we've talked a lot about you know, how science gets done and how we get science out and to, you know, the, the, the scientific community and the public. And so this is a really fun opportunity for us to share, you know, to share some of this work that we've done. And, um, you know, we're really excited that people are, are, you know, learning some more about East Antarctica along with us. Sounds great, Graham. Yeah, so, and, and I'm really excited. We could jump right in, but I'm really excited to talk about some of the history of Antarctic science and just Antarctic exploration, too. Yeah, it's going to be really fun. Um, Antarctica is a really, a really neat spot. And there's, you know, interestingly enough, for, in, in terms of, of frontiers on Earth, Antarctica is really kind of the final frontier. Um, it's this land of you know, where exploration came really late because it's so hard to get to and it's so inhospitable. And so it's kind of funny that, you know, folks had been, even Aristotle, for instance, had, had hypothesized that there was an Antarctic uh, pole, just like there was a North Pole. Uh, but it wasn't until 1820 when sealing ships and a Russian exploration ship first caught sight of the land in Antarctica. So that's really only 200 years ago that people really knew Antarctica even existed. And it wasn't until 100 years ago, Gavin, that folks really started trying to get to the South Pole in earnest. Wow, Graham. Yeah, I can imagine that it's not really easy to get to. And it's pretty much covered in ice, right? There's nothing much there. <laughs> That's exactly right. And the Southern Oceans are notorious for their really choppy seas and their really high winds. Um, you know, it, there's basically this ring around the bottom of the earth of open ocean. And so there's nothing to break up the winds there. So you pretty much just have these, these howling winds ripping across the bottom of the earth uh, kind of year round. And so it's, it's tough to get down there, but that's only the beginning of your troubles. Cause once you get there, you just have basically one giant ice cube that you need to, to get across. Wow. And so it wasn't until 1911 that um, Amundsen and his Norwegian exploration team made it to the South Pole. They beat a British exploration group led by Robert Scott by five weeks. And while Amundsen's crew made it back alive, Scott's crew didn't. So this was you know, a very, very dangerous thing that folks were doing, trying to get to the South Pole. But it wasn't, so folks finally made it to the South Pole of around nine, uh, 19, 1911, but it wasn't until 1958, another 50 years later, that folks managed to actually go all the way over the continent. So after folks had gotten to the pole, they wanted to go all the way across from, from one side to the other. And it took them another 50 years to be able to accomplish that. Wow. Yeah, so really, Graham, everything we know about Antarctica scientifically is coming 
from the last 50, 60 years. So it's really just a, a burgeoning young scientific place, right? It is. We're just scratching the surface of it. And that makes it really exciting. We've, you know, the, the, the history of Antarctic exploration is kind of wrapping up, but that makes the way for a really exciting, you know, new frontier of Antarctic science. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? That's right, Graham. Yeah. So right after that uh, trans-Antarctic exploration mission, the Antarctic Treaty System was signed. And so in 1961, this was established and it was signed by 54 countries. And basically what it does is it, it, it establishes Antarctica as a scientific preserve, not to be owned by anyone, not to be conquered or anything, but just to be used to understand this pretty much new frontier. And so it bans any military activity on the continent and sets up some rules where people that everybody has to follow in order to preserve the natural history of the continent. And so what it does is it makes Antarctic exploration really an international endeavor. And so Graham, I think that because you have been down there just a couple of years ago, you have a really cool insight into how this sort of international science works. Can you tell us about, you were there at, you were there in an, in a U.S. base, U.S. base, right? That's but was right. there other countries around? There were. So I was based in McMurdo Station, which is, it used to be a naval base um, owned by the U.S. before the treaty was signed. And then they quickly converted it into a science base. And there are a lot of American scientists there. But there's also scientists from around the world that work there. And so often they're collaborating with American scientists, but you know, there was a, one, of our, one of the groups I was working with, they had a bunch of folks from, uh, from Denmark and uh, you know, there was just you know, people from, from around the world who were there, but there's also a bunch of other bases. There's an Italian base over on the, um, the Antarctic Peninsula on the other side of the continent. We were just uh, about a mile away from the New Zealand base and would sometimes go over there to have um, to have some drinks or they would come over and visit us at our base. And so it's really a, an awesome, almost cosmopolitan international community there that, that makes for some really exciting science. And you and I actually just attended a, a, a virtual conference by a group called SCAR that helps to promote that international collaboration. That's right, Graham. It's really a, a pretty unique community because it's just everybody wants to know a little bit about this country and it takes pretty much all of the nations of the world in a collaborative effort to understand it, especially because it's so expensive and they're big, it's always a big endeavor to get science done down there. So it's cool that it's international. That is awesome. So Gavin, certainly, you know, everyone or many scientists seem to be very interested in this. So can you give us just a little bit of context for why this place is, you know, such an exciting scientific location? Sure. Yeah. So I'll take everyone through what it's like, what the, what the geology and the setting is like in Antarctica. And I'll, I'll also set up a little bit about our particular project and how our recent discovery has added to this knowledge base. And so over here on the left, I have a satellite image of the continent. And so as you can see, it's mostly white and beige. And as I alluded to before, the Antarctic continent is 99% covered in ice. And this isn't just a little bit of ice, this is kilometers of ice. So in the thickest places, ice, is, ice can be four or five kilometers thick. And so this is a pretty thick ice sheet covering the entirety of the continent and rocks only, you know, push out of the ice in certain places. And so um, what, it's, what you can see here is that, right, can you see my cursor, Graham? Uh, no, I can't, but I'll, I'll show you here. Are you trying to point out the Transantarctics? That's right, the Transantarctic yeah. Mountains. So there's a big mountain range right in the middle of the continent, and that's an area where rocks peak out, and there aren't too many places. So it's really hard to, to uh, understand the geology, and it's really taken some advances in science to understand the geology. And I also have another map over here to the right, and that's a map of the bedrock. So the bedrock elevation, this is an elevation map. And as you can see, um, the blue colors, the darker colors are areas where you are below sea level. The um, light blue is where you're basically at sea level and then greens and yellows are where you're above sea level. And this 
this bedrock elevation is why we think of Antarctica as having two sides, the west side and the east side. And those two sides are separated by the Trans-Antarctic Mountains in the middle there that Graham was just pointing out right there, yes. And so the west side of Antarctica, as you can see, is mostly blues and dark blues. So that means that most of that, the part of the continent on the west side of the Trans-Antarctic is below sea level. And on the contrary, the east side is mostly above sea level. And this has a really important implication when we think about the melting of the ice. So ice that's in basins or in areas of the continent that's below sea level has a much higher propensity to melt. And so when the climate gets hotter, West Antarctica melts much faster and more frequently than East Antarctica. And up until just about 10 years ago, people thought that East Antarctica probably hasn't melted for millions and millions of years they knew West Antarctica melted whenever it got hot in the Pleistocene in the past, you know, thousand, uh, hundred thousands of years. But they thought that East Antarctica has not melted for a really long time. And this has a really big implication for sea level because there's a really, there's a large amount of ice on the West Antarctic ice sheet, but there's 80% of all of the Earth's fresh water is trapped in the East Antarctic ice sheet. So we really want to know when the East Antarctic ice sheet is melting, because if it does melt, it, it will have huge implications to how to the level of sea level. Now, Graham, do you notice anything about, there are blue areas in the East Antarctic ice sheet. What, what's up with those blue areas on the east side? That's very true, Gavin. And I notice you've got this, you, you placed a red box over one of them in particular. Yeah, so what it looks to me is that there are parts of the East Antarctic ice sheet that are right around sea level, maybe even a little bit below. So, so are, those, are those stable like the rest of the East Antarctic ice sheet? Well, Graham, people, A, people didn't even know those low elevation basins existed until we got really good maps of, of the subsurface. But it turns out that really recent science is showing that those low elevation basins on the east side also can be susceptible to melting during warm periods on Earth. But we really don't know when they have melted in the past. And so we don't know how much those, that ice has contributed to sea level in the past and how much it will contribute to the future. And so that really sets up what our paper is looking at, right, Graham? Yeah, that's, that's, that's really interesting. So maybe, yeah, these, these look like unstable places, but we don't have a way to test it until now. But before we go forward, I do just want to take a moment to recognize why that is important, because currently we are in a warming climate. And as most folks know, ice melts when it gets warm out. And so it's really important for us to understand what happens when we start, you know, if we are able to melt this ice sheet. And so just to motivate this a little bit, I think Marisa has shared the link for us. Um, but I really wanted folks to get a chance to look at this really cool uh, little program that NOAA has released. NOAA is the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration. It's a government agency. Um, so our tax dollars help pay them to you know, tell us things about what the weather is going to be, forecast the weather, keep track of changes in the ocean, the atmosphere, and the environment. And they've got this really cool little sea level rise thing where we can just zoom in here on Santa Cruz and we can start bringing sea level up. And what we see is as it goes up, a bunch of our neighborhoods and communities start turning into um, areas that can get flooded during storms and high tides. And then all of a sudden we start seeing, as we get up to about 10 feet of sea level rise, which is just about the amount of water that's held in that Wilkes Basin we were looking at, um, we start flooding the downtown, filling in the, the areas around the harbor. And so it's really important for us to have a sense of, of what happens when we start changing sea level. That's right, Graham. And so a really good way for us to understand what happens when we're changing sea, or, or uh, I should say, a really good way for us to figure out how sea level has changed in the past is to look to areas like Antarctica to see how much how much ice has melted in the past. And that's really what we're after here. That's right. And 
you know, we'll we'll mention this again at the end. We're not saying that Wilkes Bates Basin is going to melt tomorrow and flood Santa Cruz, but it's important to know how this might respond to a warming climate as time goes on. So, what do you say we dive into some science, Gavin? Sounds great, Graham. Great. Let me figure out how to use my my computer here. Great. So this all started from um, you know ideas that we were working on during some field work a couple years ago. Um, in Taylor Valley, Antarctica. So this place is special because, Gavin, you mentioned that 99% of the continent, or was it 99.9? It was a, a huge part of the continent is covered in ice, almost all of it. But there are just a few specks where dry ground peaks out. And one of those places are the McMurdo Dry Valleys, and Taylor Valley is one of them. And so down here, um, we're looking all the way up Taylor Glacier towards the East Antarctic Ice Sheet, which you can just get a peek of over here. Um, we look over here and here's Taylor Glacier, which is, you know, coming to an end in the valley. And this is really special because these valleys are these little windows to the bottom of the East Antarctic Ice Sheet, or to the bottom of any part of the Antarctic Ice Sheets. Because there's so much ice, it ends up uh, draining out into the oceans. And so all of the edges of these glaciers are underwater. But this place is special because we actually get to see the very edge of this ice sheet peeking out. And as we can see here, there's something kind of funky going on. This is called Blood Falls for this bright red color. And it's a brine seep where briny waters are oozing out, leaking out of the bottom of the glacier from the East Antarctic ice sheet up to the surface. Wait a second, Graham. So you're telling me this is a brine? Are you talking like a pickle brine or an olive brine? What do you mean by brine? It's actually a lot like that. Of course, we're not making food out of it. But when we find a really salty water, even saltier than the ocean, we often, as scientists, call that a brine. And so what's coming out of here is some really, you know, really salty water, much saltier than ocean water. Um, that's sort of oozing out from the base of this glacier. And there's so much stuff in it that it's actually turned rusty. Wow. Yeah, and so when we, we were very interested in trying to understand, you know, how is this forming? Is it happening beneath Taylor Glacier here? And the more we studied it, the more we realized that these waters are coming not from right under this glacier where we can see it here, but from way, way back up in the ice sheet. And so, Gavin, we needed to find a window into the bottom, wa the waters below that ice sheet, way, way out where that ice is thickest, you know, miles deep. So Gavin, I think you might have a solution for us here. Ah, yes, Graham, of course we have a solution. And that solution is something that a lot of folks might be familiar with because we talked about these type of rocks in a previous rock and pop up. And these are chemical sedimentary rocks precipitates for short. And if, if people remember back to our chemical sedimentary rock, uh, rock and pop up, we said that these rocks form out of solution. They form from a fluid. And so what better way to understand a fluid like blood falls than to find chemical sedimentary rocks that formed underneath the ice sheet, but just so happened to be at the surface today. And so Graham, we figured out that there is a there is a repository of rocks where we can look at and find maybe a subglacial precipitate right where is this repository yeah so this repository is kept at the uh i think it's the bird polar institute um or i, I often mix up some of my polar institutes but there's a, a polar institute in ohio uh, where folks have been, has sort of been a, a U.S. base for a lot of polar and especially Antarctic research. Um, and the, and, you know, folks have been collecting rocks across Antarctica for, you know, tens and tens of years now, since the, you know, the treaty went into effect in 1960. And um, most of these rocks, Gavin, were collected in the 80s from places like we've got behind us here, a spot called Elephant Moraine, and Gavin, tell us, how are these rocks getting up to the, the surface of this ice? That's right, Graham. And so, as we said, these rocks are forming in fluids, in brines, that are underneath the glacier, underneath kilometers of ice. And so it's not really clear as to how we get them, right? 
And so this schematic here on the right is showing how they form, where they form, and how they get to the surface. So if you look at this red star on this map over here on the left, this is to get everybody thinking about where in the Antarctic ice sheet we're looking at. Right up against the Transantarctic Mountains, you have ice from the Wilkes Basin running into the bedrock of the Transantarctic Mountains. So if you look at the schematic here on the right, the ice is flowing and it's hitting the bedrock. This peak in the middle could be thought of as the Transantarctic Mountains. And so in the basin here on the left where, um, where I have pointed out basal meltwater, that's right. So this could be thought of as Wilkes Basin and in these low lying areas, you get water, you get brines, salty waters, and that's where we form these chemical precipitates. Then as the ice sheet is flowing over these low points, it plucks up these, set of, these chemical precipitates in the bottom of the ice sheet. So the bottom of the ice sheet is all dirty with sediments. Some of those sediments are the chemical precipitates that it's plucked out of place out of the Wilkes Basin. Now, as you go up, ag up against the Transantarctic Mountains, some of that dirty meltwater or dirty ice gets entrained in the rest of the ice. And then you have these areas where the ice is sublimating. It's going from a, um, or sublimating, it's going from a solid to a gas. So you're getting rid of ice at the surface and you're left with all of the dirt that are entrained in that ice sheet. And so this actually forms what we call elephant moraine, what we have behind us. And these are basically big sort of uh, piles of dirt that are coming from the bottom of the ice sheet after all of that dirt is entrained in the ice sheet, once that ice is sublimated off, you are left with just the dirt there. And then some scientist comes along and looks in all of that dirt and finds these little, you know, hand-sized chemical sedimentary rocks that were originally from the base of the ice sheet. And then our advisor calls up the rock repository in Ohio and requests to get some of these rocks. So we didn't actually, we didn't actually collect these. Another scientist collect them, collected them in the 80s, but places like Ohio State have collaborations where we can call up and get some rocks. And so that's how we got this precipitate. And Graham, what did we do? What did we look at in this precipitate that actually got us to understand what, where, when the ice was melting? Uh, Gavin, well, we did what all good geochronologists do. Uh, we try and date it. And that's exactly what our advisor did. Um, <clears throat> and he dated a lot of a lot of these actually I'll go back a lot of these uh, little white milky areas um, I think you also made some of these measurements as well I didn't I came in and did some some work with the map a little bit later on um, but <clears throat> you you measured these dates and what we found is that those layers in there those milky layers were forming between 270 and 150,000 years ago that's when that precipitate was forming and there's this really special sort of geochemistry in there. The chemistry of these is showing that they formed over that time range in a basin that was evolving um, and changing sort of separate from the ocean. It wasn't, you know, it was covered by ice. It was isolated from the ocean. Uh, and so what it means, um, you know, I've got the original figure down here. This is a bunch of science jargon gobbledygook that, um, <clears throat> would take us days and days to, to go through all the details of. But instead, what we can really break it down to is just this idea that over 400,000 years ago, for some amount of time, the ice sheet had, had, had sort of snuck back over Wilkes Basin and the ocean had probably flushed in there um, and sort of refreshed that water with ocean water. And then sometime around 400,000 years ago, um, up until today, that ice slid back over it. But, and so here I've got, you know, our little rock forming here in that, in that puddle of water beneath the ice sheet. And so, Gavin, what this is, this is a model, a, a scientific model. And I use that word to say, when we want to understand the system, we've made some measurements of it, and we come up with a story to explain that system. Sometimes it's just a set of ideas. Sometimes there's some math involved in it. 
Um, but at the end of the day, the set of ideas in this story is what we call a model to explain the history, the geologic history of something. And you know, there's a great saying that I learned from a, uh, an old teacher of mine that you know, all models are wrong because they're oversimplified. They're ways of taking nature and taking a lot of the complexity out of it. Um, but all models are wrong. They're all oversimplified, but many models are useful. And that's exactly what we're, we're trying to do here. We're trying to really understand what's going on here. So we're trying to find the use of a model here. And so at 400,000 years ago, right around then, we have the ice coming forward and sealing off this area. But the ice being back at 400,000 years ago and coming forward, Gavin, that's really important, isn't it? That's right, Graham. So just to reiterate what you said, we basically have these chemical data. Mm -hmm. And you can go to the next slide. That's OK. okay. But just, just to re-go over that for a quick second, we have these chemical data. And those chemical data tell us that that ice in Wilkes Basin, where I have this red outline here, melted. And what happens when that ice melts? Seawater rushes in that low elevation basin, that is Wilkes Basin, and it floods the basin at 400,000 years. And then as the earth gets colder again, that ice readvances and covers up that basin again. And so what our chemical data are showing us is exactly that. The signal of the seawater at 400,000 years ago and then the uh, basically the chemical data that show that that basin was then re-isolated from seawater. And so you had mentioned, Graham, that 400,000 years ago was a really important time in the Earth's climate. So just to get everybody up to speed with what's happening in the climate hundreds of thousands of years ago, you have cyclic change, you have climate cycles. The climate goes from warm periods to cold periods. We call those glacial, glacial periods and then interglacial periods. And what was happening 400,000 years ago, this was a really long interglacial period. The earth was about one to two degrees hotter than it is today. And it not only was one to two degrees hotter, it was hot for a pretty long time. And so that long period of a warmer climate made the ice in Wilkes Basin, this low elevation basin in East Antarctica, East Antarctica melt. And that just this little area of East Antarctica melting adds a cumulative five meters to the global sea level. So that's five extra meters just from this little part of the ice sheet melting. And so that's a pretty big deal, right, Graham? That's right. That gets us up in the neighborhood of those those ten feet we looked at on the on the NOAA webpage earlier. So you know that's a that's a lot of water, and you know it. We don't know exactly when it'll happen, but we but what we do know from looking at the the geologic history is we know that melting that with just a few degrees of warming compared to now is possible. It has happened in the past, and it could happen again. That's right. And so as we get more CO2 in the atmosphere, we expect our climate to rise to these sort of temperatures. And if they are prolonged, this study shows that we can in fact be sourcing ice and thus water to the global seas from East Antarctica, which as you said, can have a big, big change on how much water is in the ocean. That's right. And what it brings, what it brings around for, for us is it's important for you know, other scientists to keep this in mind and for communities to, you know, keep all these sorts of ideas in mind as we, you know, plan and prepare for a future with a warm climate. All these things help, you know, help us to make decisions and sort of shape the way we, you know, plan for our cities and our, you know, our coastal regions as, as time goes forward and the climate, you know, continue warms, continues to warm with CO2 emissions. That's right. Yeah, so that's pretty much the gist of our paper. That's um, great. Yeah. Yeah, and your paper was picked up by some pretty big places. I read about it in National Geographic and Nature and Science Magazine. So congrats, guys, on, on the recognition. That's got to be exciting. 
Yeah, it is. It's, it's really cool to, to see your work in a place like National Geographic. It's just, you know, you read it as a kid. So being able to log on and see one of your papers is kind of, kind of fun. Yeah, good, good for y'all. And, um, and I wanted to share really quickly a little bit about um, what you were just mentioning about how this information is useful. And just for our Santa Cruz community watching um, to know that the city of Santa Cruz has a climate action program. And what they do is they take data like this. So they, um, they monitor um, models and think about projected sea level rise. And they think about um, what is likely to occur in Santa Cruz in the future based on what we know. And they come up with plans for how to mitigate that both um, to support a global system, but also on um, what um, we need to do within uh, Santa Cruz and how we um, may respond to if and when that that does occur. So if people want to learn more, they can go to the Climate Action Program for the city of Santa Cruz and um, and also explore resources um, like what the gents shared uh, from Noah. Um, stay informed and uh, thanks to both of you for sharing um, not just the narrative of what we could expect, but also a little bit more of the details of behind the scenes um, of, of how those models are, are made. It's really interesting. Yeah, our pleasure. It was fun. Yeah. It was and uh, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. We haven't talked about this yet, but do you have any thoughts on what you want to talk about next week? Yeah, we do. Uh, we were thinking it would be fun. Um, you know, we we sort of, you know, gone away from just some, you know, some good old, some good old rock, rock talks. So we were thinking we would do a tour of the, the state of California's gem, mineral, and rock. Ooh, that's exciting. Okay, that's great. Um, those are some, some much loved uh, geologic specimens. So I think, I don't know if we want to, do we want to give away what those are or should we save it for next week? Let's save it. We've okay. talked about it before so, so the audience could think on it and go back to the previous rock and pop-ups and see if they could find us mentioning it, but we'll, we'll keep everyone in suspense for now. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to, to get into the, the symbols of California um, next week, so thanks for that, guys. Yeah, thank you.